something about the Psalms I really love. You know, I love the honesty of it, the rawness. You know, it's something childlike. Uh, I mean, you say he's brutally honest. They are prayers. They are prophetic prayers. It's not just poetry, but it's poetry on fire. You know, so when you put a melody to something like the Lord is my rock, my strength, my shield, my strong tower. You know that heaven is agreeing with you. The Psalms were intended for corporate use. And when you sing straight from the word, you're not only singing to Jesus, but you are singing Jesus because he is the word and he is perfect theology. Oh God, you You form me in the womb You work so wonderful You know me, Lord You know me, Lord A song for me you wrote Life's journey to explore You know it all You know it all If I write Wings of dawn On the depths of seas I fall By your gracious love I'm found You're my ever-present God How precious are your thoughts, oh God I could never comprehend You who know me Inside out, you're my ever present God. You know my every thought. You search and know my heart, discern my every thought. You search me, Lord, you search me, Lord You know all of my ways And everything I say You see it all, you see it all If I rise in winds of dawn On the depths of seas I fall
Precious are your thoughts, oh God I could never comprehend You who know me inside out You're my ever-present God Greetings and thank you so much for tuning in to Living Strong today. Uh, it's been a wonderful season here where we've been looking at various psalms and uh, we now come to the concluding uh, psalm in this whole series where we've been looking at favorite psalms and just spending a few moments meditating uh, uh, on that psalm. Uh, in this concluding message in this series on the psalms, we'd like to look at Psalm 139. Now, many uh, people who study the Psalms refer to this Psalm as the Psalm of Psalms, meaning this is like the high point of the Psalms, simply because of its poetic brilliance and also for the way God is portrayed in, in this Psalm. Like no other Psalm, Psalm 139 brings out the omniscience of God, the all-knowing of God, how God knows everything. It also describes, uh, in some ways, the omnipresence of God, and also talks to us about the intimate way in which God is involved in each individual life. And no other psalm brings out these aspects of both the nature of God and the work of God. And so Psalm 139, many people call it the Psalm of Psalms, one of the most brilliant uh, uh, descriptions uh, uh, of who God is and so on, uh, and how he works in us. So let's uh, enjoy this psalm together on this program, uh, just going through it verse by verse and just picking out uh, some insights uh, as we look at them. Psalm 139, verse 1. A psalm of David, the great psalmist, the great king of Israel, wrote, verse 1, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. That word search there simply means examine intimately. And, 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 and David begins with this understanding that God knows him intimately. He has examined, looked through, looked thoroughly through David. And he knows him so intimately like no one else, no other being on earth or in heaven knows David, knows each one of us as intimately as God. He says, oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. That God knows every action we make are sitting down, are rising up. He knows every thought we think. The thoughts that we think, which, you know, we may be in the farthest place from God, and yet David says, you know my thoughts, my innermost thoughts, what's going on in my mind, even when I am in the most distant place that I could ever be. He says, you know my thoughts are far off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. God, you just know me. I, you know, wherever I go, whatever I do, all my deeds are open before you. There is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. God knows every single word we utter. Now, just think about the omniscience of God. That God, that, you know, at this point in time, let's say there are so many people on this planet, billions. And yet for each one of us, God knows us so intimately that he knows every action, every deed. He knows every thought and he knows every word in each individual's life. Now that's how magnificent God is. That's how infinite he is. That's how omniscient he is. That means that's how all-knowing he is. Comprehensive, completely. He knows each one of us as individuals. And then he says in verse 5, 
You hedged me behind and before, and you laid your hand upon me. That means, God, you surrounded me. You laid your hand upon me. That means there is no place that I can go. But God, you're not already there. So he says in verse 6, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? So in verses 1 through 6, He's talking about God's intimate knowledge of everything we do. Our deeds, our thoughts, our words. And God is so close to us that it's like God is moving with us everywhere. His hand is always upon us. He knows us so intimately. And then he talks about, in the next few verses, that about God's omnipresence. That is God. There is nowhere where I can go where you are not already there. Look at how he talks about that. He says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. So he says, God, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I go from your presence? So, while David is describing this, 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 this fact that there is no place in heaven, on earth, even if he travels with the speed of light, when he says, when I take the wings of the morning, he's talking about, you know, if I go as, as quickly as light breaks forth in, uh, in the darkness, even if I go at that speed, God, you're just there. Even if I go to the depths of the sea, you're still there. So here's something uh, a very interesting, that God dispenses himself through all of his universe, all of his creation, by his spirit. The spirit of God is a carrier of the presence of God. So he says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I go from your presence? God's Holy Spirit fills the universe. And there's no place where we can go or we can hide from the very presence of God. The other thing I just want to point out here is this. He says, God, wherever I go, your hand will lead me. Your hand will hold me. Think about that. Now translate that into your own life. Wherever you go, his hand will lead you. His hand will hold you. In whatever situation you're in, his hand will lead you. His hand will hold you. Why don't you say that out loud where you are? God's hand will hold me. God's hand will lead me. Wherever, wherever I am, whatever situation I am in, when I'm in my workplace, when I'm in the mall, when I'm in the restaurant, when I'm on the street, and when I'm at home, His hand will lead me. His hand will hold me. To lead means to guide. To hold means to have in possession. God's hand with, with, is with us, no matter where we go. His presence is always with us. His presence with us is similar to his hand leading us and holding us. What a wonderful assurance that in every situation, every day, throughout the day, his presence leads, his presence guides, and his presence protects us, holds us up. He continues, he says in verse 11, If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the, night shall light be, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. So no matter what time of day, whether it's darkness or noonday, it's the same to God. He is always there. He is present even in those moments of life. Then, He changes thought here in verse 13, and he begins to talk about God knowing our formation. So he's talked about the omniscience of God. He's talked about the omnipresence of God. Now he's talking about the omnipotence of God in dealing with the intricate formation of life. Here's how he puts it. Very beautiful. Verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. 
So the psalmist is saying, God, when I was being formed in my mother's womb, you were there, your hand was fashioning me. And then he says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It's very interesting to study that word fearfully and wonderfully in Hebrew. The word fearfully means something that has been formed, that's been suited to produce fear or reverence. So fearfully, that means I've been made in such a way that I will stimulate, I will cause fear and reverence towards God. And he says, I am wonderfully made. I've been made in a very distinct way, in a very distinguished way, separate way or a unique way. You know, if each one of us recognize that we have been fearfully and wonderfully made, that means you look at yourself, the way you've been made, it will evoke reverence towards God himself. You know, many people ask, you know, I, I need proof about God. Look at yourself. Look at how you've been made. Look at the complexity of your own body, the way it's been fashioned. He says, the way I've been fashioned should evoke reverence towards God. That's what David is saying. I am fearfully made. The fact that I've been made like this, my own body functions this way. The organs, the cells, the tissues, the bones, they all work together. This should evoke reverence in my heart towards God. I am fearfully made. I'm wonderfully made. That means I am distinctly made. There's something that distinguishes me individually from every other human being on earth. There is no other human being like me or like each one. Each person is so uniquely made. And he says, I will therefore praise you. Take a moment. Think about yourself. You have been so made that you are distinct. There's no one else like you. And you are being so made, so designed that... Uh, it, it should evoke fear and reverence of, towards God. And therefore he says, I will praise you. You can praise God because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works so that my soul knows very well. Just look at yourself. You are a marvelous work of God. And thank God for that. He says, my soul knows this very well. Verse 15 my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. My frame, that word frame, uh, talks about substance, something that means strength. And so it, it could rightly be translated bones. So my bones, what gives me strength, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, referring to being formed inside the mother's womb, and skillfully wrought. That word skillfully wrought in Hebrew literally means to be embroidered or weaved, just like as they would do with cloth. They would embroider or uh, uh, weave a garment. So he says, God, that's how I was fashioned in my mother's womb. I was, as my bones were being formed, and I was being made in secret. I was weaved. I was embroidered by God. Yeah, honestly, and you look at yourself, the unique mix of talents, giftings, inclinations, predispositions, characteristics, along with the physical stature each person has. It's a unique embroidery a unique combination, a unique weaving together of the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual coming together. He says, that's how we are. I was skillfully wrought. I was embroidered by God. I was weaved together by God in my mother's womb, bringing together the frame that is a physical part and all the other compositions of, that make you you, that distinguishes you from every other person that causes you to be fearfully and wonderfully made. You've been embroidered by God. In your, you were embroidered by God in your mother's womb, is what David says here. And then he says in verse 16, Your eyes saw my substance ye being yet unformed. Very interesting, that, that word in it, which we, there are three, three or four words, substance being yet unformed. There are three English words that come from one Hebrew word. 
substance being yet unformed just literally means an unformed mass. And therefore, we take it to mean, as David is referring to the embryo, the fetus in the mother's womb. So it says, your eyes saw that unformed, unwrapped substance, the, 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 the child being formed in the mother's womb. And while the child was still being formed in the mother's womb, David says, this is what happened. In your book, they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. Very interesting. The allusion is to a book that would be used by uh, an architect, a draftsman, where they write out their design, they write out what uh, they actually want to be done, the work that needs to take place in order to build a certain building, to produce a certain product. So he's saying, in your book, like the architect who draws out the blueprints, or the draftsman who designs what the product should look like, he says, in your book, all my days were described even before there was the first day that took place. What an amazing thought that God is so involved in our lives, is involved in your life, that while you are still unformed, while the substance was still as an embryo, a fetus in the mother's womb, God had a plan. He had a purpose. And this is something we emphasize over and over again, that God has designed you, formed you, uniquely, skillfully embroidered you, made, fearfully, made you fearfully and wonderfully in order to fulfill a purpose he had in mind, a dream that he had in mind. Like the architect who envisions a building or the draftsman who envisions a product, God envisioned a wonderful life for you. He designed, he had a dream for you, even in me, even before we were born, even before we stepped, had our first day on earth. God had a plan. He had a purpose. Now, not all of us live for that purpose. Many of us just go away, do our own thing. That's a different matter. But it, this is an invitation for you and me to turn to God and say, God, you designed me, you formed me for a purpose. Like the architect, you had a plan for my life. Like the draftsman, you had a design. Uh, 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 you wanted me to become something. God, today, I give my life back into your hands. And together with you, I want to become what you envisioned me even before I was born. I want to become what you actually designed me for. I want to become that. And if you and I do that, we will definitely journey with God into the fullness of his purpose for our lives. So he says here, verse 17, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I wake, I am still with you. He says, God, you are so intimately involved with me in my life. I am so grateful. I cannot fathom this, God. Why would such a great God be so intimately involved in my life? It's beyond my understanding. It's beyond my comprehension. Their thoughts toward me, they are so great. And imagine, this is the way God is with every individual. And then he concludes, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? Do I not loathe those who rise against you? I hate them with a the perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Meaning, I do not regard those who have no regard towards God. They are not the kind of people I want to mix with. They are not the kind of people I want to associate with. It's pointless because I know how great God is and how real God is. And it's interesting, he closes with these two verses in verse 23 and 24. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's very interesting. In verse 1, he says, God, you have searched me and known me. But when he concludes this psalm, he's asking or he's inviting God in order to search him. Hey, David, you already said God knows you. You already said God knows you so intimately. Uh, you just can't get away from him. But then why are you asking him to search you? The intent of verses 23 and 24 is different. In verse 23 and 24, he's saying, God, now I want you to search me in order for you to correct me so that I can walk with you rightly. So he says, Lord, examine me, know my heart, and you know what's going on in me. Know my thoughts 
And God, if there's any wicked way in me, please guide me. That means please correct me. Please lead me. So here is something very interesting. God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. God is omnipotent. He knows everything about us. He is always with us. And he's so intimately involved with us as uh, the omnipresent God. But yet you and I must respond and invite him in to work in our lives, to search our lives, to lead us and guide us and teach us so that we can walk with him. On the one hand, he knows us so well. On the other hand, we must invite him to search us, try us, to correct us and to lead us. A beautiful psalm. God loves you. He's intimately involved in your life, whether you recognize it or not. The question is, would you, like David, say, God, now I want you to lead me and guide me. I want to follow your wisdom, your guidance, your direction in my life. I trust you and I will do that. Let's pray. Father, we worship you, God. We honor you for who you are, how great you are. You know us completely. There's never a time we can exit from your presence. You're so omnipotent, you intimately fashioned us, formed us for a plan and a purpose. Oh God, we pray that you'll help us surrender our lives to you, to live for your purpose, to do your will, and to keep a heart that is always right before you. Help us to do this, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us on the program. And until next time, remember, live life the Jesus way.